With this, we can rebut Maximilus chronology. That there is, even if he says that uh, there was a, a sutra period during which uh, Jyotisha came about astronomy, then then we can say Vedanga Jyotisha can be dated at date of 3000 BC. So how is that possible? Rig Veda says 1200 BCE, but then the stories in Rig Veda, Aditi and Ashwini, it can be dated to much greater antiquity. So astronomy is showing something else. Max Miller was confronted with this. He was asked, should all of Indian chronology be held hostage to biblical chronology? Because that is where he came from. And he got so upset, he wrote this book in which he said that I'm not going to accept any Indian text as reliable. He says, I'll only accept Colebrook's Vedanga Jyotisha date because that is after Aryan invasion theory, 1400 BC. But the remaining things, he said, I'm not going to accept it. They're all unreliable texts. So t today's talk uh, is going to be pretty fast paced because the topic is so vast. There's so much of material to cover. So I'm going to be going pretty fast through some of these uh, uh, topics. So please do make notes and uh, uh, let me know uh, in the end about your questions. To start with, we're going to start with some prerequisites on the antiquity of the Indian civilization. This is important because uh, 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 we cannot understand or appreciate Indian astronomy until we come to grips with how ancient is the Indian civilization. Astronomy that is contained in Vedas, Brahmanas, Sutras, Upanishads, and so on. And then we'll go on to the Indian astronomy model, Nakshatras, Rashi, earliest texts, Vedanga Jyotisha, the Siddhantas, and the major surviving Siddhanta works. We'll talk about the celestial calendar, the timekeeping. We'll talk about mathematical astronomy, models, measurements. Uh, We'll also talk about models, measurements, and math, famous astronomers, and some Western controversies. So like I said, the earliest astronomical wisdom was encoded in ancient Vedic literature, like the Brahmanas, Samhitas, Arnyakas, and so on. And the wisdom was also encoded as metaphors and Purana stories and Upanishad episodes and so on. And one will have to understand what exactly did the, do the metaphors, metaphors communicate. If we don't have the key to unlock the wisdom in the metaphor, it becomes like a ridiculous mythology and so on. So we got to understand some of that. We'll also see that an ancient tradition of mathematical astronomy developed the Siddhantas. And like I mentioned earlier, the study of Indian astronomy is greatly impeded because we have a badly corrupted chronology on the history of India. So the first step to appreciation of astronomy is to understand how the narration of Bharatiya history has several problems. And towards that, I will first, in a very few slides, talk to you about uh, some of these issues. So uh, there are several frameworks imposed in the historiography of uh, India. And uh, initially, the colonial people who wanted to write the history of India, they came with their own ideologies and so on. It was layered upon by Eurocentric people who wanted to know why are Sanskrit, Latin, and Greek related? And what is the relation of Indians to Western Europeans? So they came with their own constraints and so on. It was followed by the missionaries who had their own axe to grind over here and came with a whole uh, set of narratives of their own, layering even more in the history of India. And since uh, 1947, we have a socialist academia, unfortunately, with its horrendous biases that have come in. And uh, everything in the Indian context is seen in the context of predator, uh, pre uh, prey kind, or uh, oppressor, oppressed kind of conflict kind of models are used to describe all of Indian dynamics. And finally, the Marxists, since 1972, we've had a Marxian narrative also, which looks at all of Indian social dynamics and history as a history of conflicts. So the conflict model is used to describe India. And the result of all of this is horrendous corruption on the history of India. And there are several structural problems. For example, we have an enforced narration in our NCRT and other places where we have an Aryan invasion theory, Indians are Aryans and Dravidians and tribals. Indian civilization is fairly recent, according to them. According to them, the uh, Indians were uh, nomads and illiterate people who were civilized after they made contact with Magadha, the Greeks in Magadha in 300 BCE. So they say Indian civilization is recent. The evidence, however, which I've been talking about for several years now, shows that it's an out of India uh, rather than an Aryan invasion. 
I also show that identities like Aryans, Dravidians, and tribals are manufactured. These are not real identities at the genetic level or elsewhere. And I also show that the Indic civilization is ancient. And towards that, we had to ask a question. If we ask, if we start using the Darshan of Vaisheshika, for example, perception and inference, how do we evaluate claims like this? Because everybody's got a claim of their own. So we need to examine the claims with the methodology, see the methodology they propose. What kind of data have they used to advance their claims? What are the provenance of the data? What kind of models are they using? What are the assumptions that went into those models? And what are the methodologies they've followed? What are the limitations of those methodologies? What are the claims that derive from those methodologies? So only a systematic analysis will help us to understand where the reality is. And towards that, we can see that we have a boatload of data for history from archaeology, genetics, astronomy, to science as scripts, all of these things. Anywhere you look in the Indian context, you have data with which we can try to talk of the history of India. Towards that, several models can be also looked at. The linguistics model is most prominent in the narration of Indian history. This is the one that has got the Aryan or migration theory uh, uh, resulting from that. Then we have got the archaeology model of India, we've got the genetics model of India, the astronomy model, which we'll talk about today, and many other models. So we got to see assumptions, data provenance, methodology, inferences, claims, and so on. But the bottom line in the linguistics methodology, which evolved because the Europeans wanted to say, why is Sanskrit, Latin, and Greek? Why are they related? William Jones, who was a colonial uh, uh, person who came to India, he saw these commonalities, and to explain that common uh, all the commonalities, they suggested that uh, the use of uh, the, the whole field of linguistics evolved from there on, and they proposed there is an ancestral language called Proto-Indo-European, which is perhaps somewhere between the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea, the Central Asian region. And from there, these people went out after they domesticated the wild horse and got iron swords and chariots. They conquered Western Europe on one side, came to India on the other side. And that is why the languages are related, according to linguistics. It is a model, and that model needs to be evaluated, but that is not a subject of today's talk. So we, we are told in our history textbooks, including NCRT, that bands of male warriors from Central Asia invaded or migrated India in 1500 BCE. They replaced the existing civilization over there and brought an entirely new Vedic religion, Sanskrit language, Vedic ecosystem, and so on. So this is what we are told. And today, the assertions by colonial historians like Max Miller, linguists like Max Miller, have become the received wisdom for our, our own uh, academia. They don't question these assumptions or models. According to Max Miller, he divided the Vedic uh, literature into four areas, the Chandas period from 1200 to 1000 BC, where the books of Rig Veda were composed, Mantra period, the remaining books of Rig Veda, the Brahmana period, 800 to 600 BC, when these words, Aryakas, Upanishads, and others were composed, and the Sutra period, 600 to 200 BCE, where the Vedangas, uh, as, as well as uh, uh, Jyotisha, astronomy, everything was composed in this time frame, according to Max Muller. And this has become the received wisdom. Nobody questions that. But if we examine the models and so on, we find a big problems over there. So people can ask, why is it that the whole world today subscribes to Aryan invasion theory? Why is it so wide? Well, colonial hegemony through people like Portuguese, Dutch, French, and the British, hand in hand with Christian imperialism, with uh, missionaries like uh, Robert Caldo, Gio Pope, hand in hand with Eurocentric scholars, Max Muller, Herbert Leslie, and so on, using methodologies like linguistics, anthropology, and this uh, spurious notion of caste, they have had convergent ideologies which have eventually led to this Aryan invasion migration theory. And today you might think that we live in enlightened times, so these are all relics of the past, so we can go past that. Unfortunately, that is not true. This has become received wisdom for our scholars who additionally use outsider sociology the kind of uh, 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 lenses that are appropriate for the Western experience, like modernism, postmodernism, feminism, and many other isms, have been imported and forced fit into India in a conflict model to look at all of Indian social dynamics in this conflict model. So they have distorted the picture tremendously in the present times. Hand in hand, archaeology, people like uh, uh, Maria Gimbutas, Colin Renfro, and the others. Uh, uh, 
and, and also people like uh, David Reich and the others who work with genetics, they continue with circular dependencies to continue to uphold this theory. This is where we are, but the evidence shows something completely to the contrary. By the end of my talk, we'll see where the astronomical evidence of India goes contrary to the narrations over here. So you might think, why am I talking all these things in a talk in astronomy? Well, the spurious Aryan invasion migration narrative has got a major impact on the people of India in the present. The false narrative says about this invasion 1500 BC when nomads, illiterate nomads who didn't even have a script, they came from Central Asia and destroyed the superior Harappa civilization. And these uh, nomads running around India with caste, cow, curry, and all these kind of things. And India had to wait for 1,000 years before civilization returned in Magadha. After Magadha made contact with the Greeks in 300 BC, suddenly India got Ashokan uh, uh, edicts, the scripts, Brahmi script, and time for knowledge generation in mathematics, astronomy, medicine. So if your civilization has any evidence of advanced knowledge, you must have learned it from older civilizations like the Greeks and Babylonians. This is a spurious theory, but this is what has been pushed today in our textbooks and so on. And so you have this cartoonish image over here, which says Aryans came from Central Asia and brought Sanskrit into India. The script Brahmi is derived from Aramaic, which came from the Levant into India. The Babylonians taught us astronomy. The Greeks taught us mathematics and sciences. The Turkic Muslims taught us uh, culture, cuisine, architecture, music, and civilization. And the British taught us science, technology, rational thought. And even bhakti was taught to us by St. Thomas who came to uh, Muzeris and so on. So what we, have, what we see is a denial of agency in history has led to this distortion of identity and growing divisive forces today. So uh, this is the reason why we uh, want to study astronomy in greater detail to understand what bearing does it have on narratives of this nature. So we go to the main topic. So here we learn about Indian astronomy. What material evidence do we have for Indian astronomy? What do the texts say? What are the stories, some of the stories, Siddhantas? Obviously, this is a big, big, big topic. I've cherry-picked a few things here and there to give you a flavor of all of these things. In the earliest astronomy, Indians were concerned with making sense of the night sky and to mark the passage of time. So by looking at the night sky, today you live in cities with uh, living in uh, apartments and flats where you can't even see the sky because of pollution and light pollution and so on. You can't see stars and other such things. But in ancient India, you had brilliant displays of the skies and you could see the stars. And uh, after, after, your, after sunset and dinner, you had no other job in summer nights but to put a charcoal outside, lie down and watch the stars and make sense of it all. So to understand phases of the moon, as it goes through the ecliptic, to understand the movement of the sun, the movement of the planets, and finally to keep time through celestial calendars. That was the concern of ancient Indians. And we have observations all over the place, even in some archaeological finds. For example, in a rock in Kashmir, you see this figure with the sun and the moon on two sides showing a, a fascination with the ancient skies going back thousands of years. In Karnataka, in a grave burial, you see stars and the sun and others. Similarly, in Kashmir, you see what appears to be four quadrants showing the cardinal points of astronomy. Maybe in Kashmir, 5000 BC, a supernova with two suns in the sky shows that. And Harappan seals that some people are trying to interpret as astronomical phenomena. For example, this is from Professor Abhayankar in, in this publication over here. And he says these two famous seals, this is a Pashupati seal with four animal figurines over here. And he interprets this as showing the equinox and solstices in 3000 BCE. And the other archaeological uh, uh, entity is this one with uh, seven standing figurines. And these have been likened to a planetary alignment that happened in 3102 BCE. We'll talk about this a little later. We also have in southern India a whole lot of megalithic uh, stone alignments, stone circles. We have labyrinths, we've got uh, dolmens and other such things. And this paper talks about one such in uh, Andhra Pradesh, where there are several stone circles of this nature aligned in different directions. So there are several interpretations people have for this, but my own interpretation is it is tracking 
either an equinox position or it is tracking some critical astronomical position, even as it changes over time. Why will it change over time? We will see that in a few slides later. We'll see why equinox positions change in the sky over time. So these alignments also, the angle changes slightly over time, which tells me that they're also trying to say, where is the direction of the equinox? So clearly, even in thousands and thousands of years ago, whoever was living, living in southern India, they too were concerned with the calendar, the passage of time, and trying to mark when the sun would be at a certain point. So they know that one more year has passed. Very interesting. So the next big thing to look at is the heritage through stories. So we know that very, very ancient knowledge has been encoded in the metaphor of stories. And like I said, if we have the key to unlock that wisdom, then the stories make sense. If you don't know what the key is to unlock that wisdom, then it becomes a silly mythology to you. And so you, our, our understanding remains at a pedestrian level. We can't understand the metaphor. So I have just taken two or three sample stories here to show what our ancestors knew about the sky and how they encoded it into a, into a story. The first thing to observe is if you have a DSLR camera and then after sunset, you put it on a tripod in the, facing it to the northern sky and leave the shutter open for some time, you're going to see this. You're going to see star trails where this star appears to be stationary in the sky and these stars go in small circles around and bigger and bigger and bigger circles. So these are the star, uh, uh, star trails that happen because of Earth's rotation. Earth appears to be rotating about this point in the sky in the northern hemisphere. This is Polaris. So it appears to be pointing to Polaris in its axis of rotation. And as it rotates from west to east, we see these kind of uh, uh, star trails over here. This observation is encoded in the story of Dhruva. So we are told that Dhruva had an unhappy childhood because his father took a younger wife and he was the son of the older wife. And one day when Dhruva went to sit on his father's lap, the younger wife came and shooed him away saying, you have no place on your father's lap. And he was exceedingly unhappy, went to his mother and asked, what is my place uh, uh, in, this, in this world? So uh, unhappy, he, leave, he leaves home and the Saptarishis meet him and teach him how to do tapasya. And he goes and does tapasya for a long time. And finally, uh, Bhagavan appears before him and asks him, what do you want? And he wants nothing. He's in a state of bliss. So Bhagavan makes him into a motionless star in the sky and says, even the Saptarishis will go in Pradakshina around you. So this is an encoding of the fact that Dhruva is a motionless star in the sky and everything else goes around. In a 24-hour period, the Saptarishis will go one full circle. But these are the positions if you look at a certain given time in spring, summer, fall, or winter. We have another story that encodes Uttarayana and Dakshinayana. These two concepts are known from Vedic times itself and it's mentioned in texts like the Surya Siddhanta, it's mentioned, for example, in Bhagavad Gita. Uttarayana refers to the six-month northward course of the sun when the days become longer and longer in the northern hemisphere. And Dakshinayana refers to a six-month southern course of the sun when the nights become longer and longer. Right now, we are in Dakshinayana, and December 22nd, we'll reach the solstice point when Uttarayana will start. So there's a story in, in Bhagavad Purana, Srimad Bhagavatam, that says that Vrika the Ashura, he got a bone from Rudra. Rudra is a stand-in for Agni, for Surya, and so on. That if he places his hand on a person's head, that person should die. Rudra is very reluctant. He doesn't want to give this bone, but uh, you know he's uh, compelled to do it. He says, all right, you can have this bone. But the minute he gets a bone, the Ashura starts pursuing Rudra because he wants to see if he places his hand on Rudra's head, will Rudra die? So Rudra runs in fear. And eventually a divine maiden comes over there and the Ashura is enamored by her and he wants to marry her. She says, you're Nankut Ashura. And he says, no, no, I am very refined. I know dancing and singing and all that. She says, follow my steps. So he tries to dance and follow her steps. Eventually she places her hand on her own head, forgetting about the bone. This Ashura places his hand on his head and he falls dead. But the story is, he is killed on the day of Uttarayana. So if you look at the story in some detail, Vrika is another name for the wolf. And wolf is a nocturnal animal. It hunts at night and sleeps during the day. And so 
when Vrika is chasing Rudra, it means the sun is going to the southern uh, hemisphere, is going to the southern southernmost point at minus 23.3 degrees latitude. And in the meantime, in the northern hemisphere, it's becoming the time of the wolf, where the nights are becoming longer and longer and so on. On the day of Uttarayana, when this wolf is killed, then the sun returns back to the northern hemisphere and the days become longer. So it encodes clearly the story of Uttarayana, Dakshinayana, showing that Indians had a very good understanding of the cardinal points of astronomy. The two equinoxes and the solstice positions were pretty well known to them. We have a story of uh, Chandra too. So we are told that in uh, Matsya Purana and several other Puranas that Chandra married the 27 daughters of King Daksha. So this story is encoding the movement of the, of the moon. If you observe, every day the moon appears over an eastern horizon at a slightly different time, maybe about 40 minutes later or so, every day they're able to see that. And they also observe that it takes 27 days approximately for the moon to come back to the same backdrop of the stars. So they divided the entire ecliptic into 27 segments of 13 and one third degrees each. And they named each of them for one of the wives of the moon saying that the moon will spend one night in every one of his wife's homes and the nakshatras are given the names of the, of the wives and that's how we get to remember which star follows which star if you know the mnemonics and stories of the nakshatras. So we are told that uh, Chandra visited a wife every day and this story relates to the 23, 27.3 day sidereal month. Sidereal month means the month is marked by knowing which nakshatra the moon is in. Every day when the moon appears in the eastern horizon, that says the nakshatra for the day. Where, where is the moon in which uh, nakshatra? That tells the nakshatra of the day. So eventually we're also told that Daksha, his father-in-law, is furious because Chandra loved Rohini more than the others. And he condemns Chandra. He says that, how dare you? How can you treat my daughters unequally? For this transgression, you shall die. So Chandra doesn't want to die. He runs out to Mahadeva and says, please save me. And then Mahadeva says, I can't remove that curse, but I'll change it. And Chandra gets a life of waxing and waning. So he goes through from Amavasya, eventually to Pornami, back to Amavasya. This is a cycle of the moon. And this part of the story is related to the 29.5 day synodic month. So that story has got three elements to it. One element that he married 27 daughters, that is a sidereal month. The other element of waxing and waning related to the synodic month. And the third story is a little more complex. Why did he love Rohini more than the others? I will not go into that. It's a big story. But uh, bottom line, uh, we, we know about the synodic month, the sidereal month. We also know about Uttarayana and Dakshinayana. So we know the solar year, sidereal month, synodic month, and Indians try to make sense out of all these things. How do we reconcile these three observed phenomena in our passage of time. So reconciling gave different insights, including the Adhikamasa, the desire to synchronize the solar year and the lunar year meant every three years, they'll have an additional month, the Adhikamasa. Also it gave rise to different yugas from the five-year cycle of Vedanga Jyotisha to the 19-year cycle, the Samvatsara cycle, all the way to Chaturyuga Yuga cycle. All these are intellectual developments of the ancient Indians as they try to figure out different cycles and different phenomena in the sky and synchronizing all of these things. So eventually the love story of Rohini is related to occultation. The moon uh, passes over a star at uh, different uh, points in its journey on the ecliptic. And if it obscures uh, Rohini as it does over here, that is referred to an occultation. And the occultation phenomena also happens because of this phenomenon that the ecliptic is a plane in which the sun goes and the moon is offset, the moon's orbit is offset by five degrees approximately. Because of this five degree offset, there's a plus or minus five degrees or 10 degree variation around the ecliptic. The nakshatras are divided along the ecliptic, ecliptic in different uh, degrees from it. Because of that, the moon will touch some of them and not touch some of them, also as a consequence of the tilt of the Earth's axis. So there was a period of time when moon obscured Rogini more than the other nakshatras, and this story is remembering that. That is what this is showing to you, that this is the ecliptic, over oh, here is Aldebaran, which is Rohini, and you have Regulus, and you have Spica, and other stars over here. So depending on whether it's 5 degrees or 10 degrees or on the ecliptic, different kind of occultations will happen. 
So in my TEDx talk, I've talked a little more about this. Our scriptures also have enormous astronomic content. And I've given some examples over here. Uh, Rig Veda, this is from uh, Siddharth's paper on Bulletin Astronomical Society of India, 1998. Rig Veda in this Mandela 25.8, it talks about Varuna who knows the 12 moons and he knows the moon of later birth. And he shows this is related to this 29.5 day synodic month. So it is also related to, to how to reconcile with, with, with the lunar year and solar year and so on. In one more place, it talks about the wheel of time has 12 parts referring to the months, 360 spokes or days, or 720 pairs of day and night with a remainder of about five days. In another place, the Vishnu or the sun sets in motion the wheel of three 120-day periods. We'll see what is this 120-day period a little later, referring to the seasons and, and so on. So clearly, you also have astronomical phenomena contained in the Vedic uh, literature also. It also encodes complex phenomena. For example, in this uh, third Mandela, 9 9, there's this cryptic number, 3339 Devas worship Agni, who is a lord of the seasons. And once again, Siddharth, as well as uh, Subhashka, they, they try to explain this one in terms of uh, uh, several breakups of this number. There's a 297 year period. The number of intercalary days is 3339. And these 3339 days are almost exactly 113 synodic months. So in, in 297 lunar years of 354 day period, we have this many intercalary days or 113 synodic months and so on. So there are these kind of very, very interesting astronomical phenomena that are comp uh, complicatedly encoded inside the Rig Veda. And this is an amazing aspect of this. And this book talks about a whole lot of uh, more such phenomena. What this says is, even from an exceedingly early period of time when the Rig Veda was composed, our ancestors had already mastered a lot of things about the sky, about numbers, and have encoded some of these things over here. So with that, we can start talking about the Indian astronomical model. What was the Indian astronomical model? And how did it help? in marking the passage of time. So the Indian astronomical model was one of nakshatras and rashi. We've already seen that they divided the ecliptic into 27 segments of 13 and one third degree each. And they gave it the names of the wives of the moon, like Chitra, Vishaka, Jeshta, and so on. And most people, the minute they see nakshatra, rashi, they, they have a Pavlovian response that it refers to Jyotisha, and they don't believe in astrology or horoscope. So this kind of pedestrian understanding has come to our people. Unfortunately, it masks the reality that it was exceedingly complex knowledge of astronomy and mathematics that our ancestors are referring to. And in this case, here are all the nakshatras shown in this circle. And whenever the moon the, uh, appears, the full moon appears over a certain nakshatra, for example, if, it, if the full moon appears over the chitra nakshatra, that lunar month is the chaitra masa. In some parts of India, the full moon was used. In some parts of India, the new moon, Amavasya, that was used. So you have the Chaitra Masa slightly offset in these two places. And uh, depending on whether Northern India, Southern India, Eastern India, you have the Amanta month or the Purni Amanta month, and depending upon these things. So anyway, the notion of a lunar month derives from whether the new moon or full moon appears over there. There was also a division of the sky in 30 degree segments. There were 12 of them. This is a Rashi model. Rashi model was done to track the movement of the, of the sun. To track the movement of moon, it was nakshatras. To track the movement of the sun, it was Rashi. That's why we have a lunisolar calendar. This is the listing of the nakshatras in two of our ancient books, Vedanga Jyotisha, Suri Siddhanta. And when the British uh, came to India, they wanted to understand this in relation to the constellation model which they had based on their zodiac. So Kritika is uh, identified with Eta Tauri, Rogni with Alpha Tauri, Mrigashira, Lambda, Orionis, and so on, Revati, Zeta Piscean. So the, the names correspond almost the same in two of our ancient books, Vedanga Jyotisha and Suri Siddhanta, showing the antiquity of this. I've also put for over here a collection of the names in Sanskritam, in Telugu, Kannada, Hindi, Gujarati, Marathi, Tamil, and Malayala. To show you that, the uh, nakshatra model is common throughout India. 
In fact, it is so ancient that in some parts of India, divergences have happened. For example, in Tamil and Malayalam, instead of Ardra, we have Thiruvadirai. Or instead of Ashlesha, we have Ailiam. So this way, when you see some uh, regional divergences, you know how ancient this model has been. So the isolation uh, gives some of these divergences. So in other words, we have a common astronomical model throughout the country, and we also see regional divergences uh, 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 showing the antiquity of these. I took this picture when I went to Darashuram uh, in Ayurvathavishra Ayra temple near Tanjavu, and on the ceiling of this temple, we see the Rashis, the 12 Rashis. So there's a controversy about this. The controversy is European Indologists, they claim that the Rashi appeared for the first time in India in Varahamita's time, hinting that it was copied from hinting that uh, the solar signs derived from the 12 Adityas, which were gradually replaced by Rashi names in the first millennium BCE. And we know that the 12th sign zodiac began in Babylon in 450 BCE. We know that also. And we have a far more uh, ancient model in India itself. Okay, so thus far, what I've done is I've tried to show you the controversies in the deep history of India, the need to understand that uh, the, history, the antiquity of India is far more ancient than what we learn in our textbooks. Then we went on to uh, look at the uh, stories, that earliest stories were encoded in uh, earliest astronomical wisdom was encoded in stories. We took a look at that. We also took a look at uh, material evidence through uh, archaeology to see where there is uh, knowledge of astronomy. And we saw very ancient knowledge of astronomy and the desire of Indians to mark the passage of time as seen in southern India, northern India, in different places. Then we went on to uh, take a look at uh, different notions of synodic month, sidereal month, solar year, and so on. We looked at the nakshatra and the Rashi model, and we finally uh, uh, took a look at the Rashi model and talked about the controversy. So given all these things, it is clear that marking time was a critical occupation. So we'd like to talk about calendars, coordinate systems, measurements, and so on. So we know that synodic month has been used to measure the titi, the phases of the moon, and so on. Sidereal month used for the nakshatras. Solar year, Uttrayana, Dakshinayana. So these things are very clear to us. And we know that even today, we mark time in Panchanga. Panchanga is a five-dimensional measure of time where the basic unit is a muhurta, which is one thirtieth of a day, or in our modern thing, it's 48 minute interval. And that refers to the sidereal measurement of nakshatra of the day, the synodic tithi of the day. The tithi ranges all the way from Pratama, Dvitiya, Tritiya, Chaturthi, all the way to Amavasya to Pornami. So what is the tithi? What is the vara, the day of the week? What is the yoga, the angle extended by the sun and the moon? And finally, karana, which is tithi by two. So in India, day rise or day always begins at sunrise. At sunrise, these entities are determined and we have an understanding of the time of the day based on these things. We have evidence of weekdays also. We have the names for Ravi, Soma, Mangala, Budhan, Guru, Shukra, Shani, and so on. And evidence for this comes from Aryabhatiya, for example, or Surya Siddhanta, which is talking about the ordering of the weekdays, association with various grahas and other things. It comes from this particular verse where the above mentioned the previous verse, seven grahas beginning with Saturn are arranged in the order of increasing velocity are lots of successive hours. The grahas occurring forth in the order of increasing velocity are the lords of the successive days reckoned from sunrise in Lanka. Similarly, Suri Siddhanta has got a similar kind of explanation, which says starting from Saturn downwards, the fourth graha is called the Lord of the Day. Graha starting with Saturn, successively downwards, are the Lords of the Hour. So we see ancient understandings of the names of the weeks and also. We also have uh, names for the solar and lunar months. We already saw how if the full moon appears, the Chitra Nakshatra, that is the Chaitra Masa, if it happens over Vishaka, the Vaishaka uh, month, and so on. So we have different lunar months. We also have Rashi, which meant, uh, marks the solar month. So clearly, Indians had a uh, time of the day through the uh, Panchanga. They had the time of the, uh, the weekday. You knew which week it is. You had the solar month and the solar and the lunar month, also the marking the measurement of this. So over 5,000 or more years, we have had several time constants in calendars. For example, one muhurta is 48 minutes. 30 muhurtas is in one day, is an ahuratra, 
which is a sidereal day of 24 hours. 30 Ahuratrans is one Masa, which has got 30 Tithis, approximately 29.5 days, which we have seen already is a synodic month. Two Masas form one Ritu or a season of 60 days. If we have three Ritus, that forms one Ayana, which is around 180 days. We talked about Uttrayana and Dakshinayana, about 180 days. Two Ayanas make a Varsha, which is a lunar year of 360 days. Now you might wonder, wait a minute, it is 365.24 days. What is this 360 days doing here? Well, the Rig Veda is talking about a year, like we already said, 360 days, 720 days and nights and so on. And Abhyankar, Professor Abhyankar is calling out that in the very ancient times, the shortfall between the lunar year and the solar year was adjusted by the Atiratra sacrifice that will last for 4.5 to 6 days in which you don't measure time. So uh, by that way, you could get synchrony. But then in Atharva Veda, also we had a strange statement saying Rishi Rohita created the Adhikamasa. This is also there in Rig Veda. So clearly, even understanding the calculations of the Adhikamasa was known from Rig Veda as well as Atharva Veda. So clearly, Indians had a, a, a deep understanding of the passage of time. They were able to uh, measure it very precisely and keep track of time. That is what all of these things are showing us. And over time, we have had so many regional calendars in India. For a country as big as India, you can expect so many regional variations. So we have got the calendar, the lunisolar calendar, the solar calendar, and since 1957, the mathematical calendar. In lunar calendar, we already seen Amanta month, Purni Amanta month. In southern India, we got, in the western India, the Amanta. In northern India, the Purni Amanta. Then the solar year is followed in Tamil, uh, Oriya, Malayali, Bengali calendars, and so on. There you have such things. So looking at this map, the blue over here is a Purni Amanta in northern India where the full moon is seen as a marker of the, the lunar month. Then the, uh, the, the, the orange over here is Western Amanta, Southern Amanta is uh, uh, green over here. And the solar solar year is followed in Benga as well as in Tamil Nadu. And you can see. So several parts of India have used different uh, ways to keep track of the uh, passage of time. I don't expect you to read this, but we also have the 60-year Samatsara cycle. So this was based on noticing that Saturn takes 30 years to complete one revolution or come back to the same zodiacal plane. And Jupiter takes 12 years to complete a revolution or come back to the same zodiacal plane. So the resonance of Saturn and Jupiter is 30 times 2 and 12 times 5, which is 60 years, when Guru and Shani both come to the same zodiac. So our ancient Indians observed that and they mark the 60-year calendar in addition that is followed in various places. Now, we have clearly seen that Indians have ways to mark the passage of time over the day, over the week, over the month, over the year. So uh, over even uh, 60 years and so on. We'd like to mark the passage of time over much greater periods of time. For that, we've got eras. So we have various eras like the Kali Yuga era, the Buddha Nirvana, the Mahavira Nirvana. So we mark the passage of time starting from there to the present time. Even today, uh, uh, Hindus, when they do their prayers, they say, how much of time has elapsed from Kali Yuga down to the present time? So those kind of prayers are also set, showing the deep uh, association of the nation with the marking of, uh, of time itself. So when we talk about time, we need to end it with understandings of great cycles. We saw that uh, there's a five-year yuga in Vedanga Jyotisha and Suri Siddhanta now talks about the Chatur Yuga system of a, of a certain time frame. Srimad Bhagavatam talks about this uh, enormous cycle of time. So we have a Chatur Yuga, which is four yuga, Satya, Treta, Dwapara, Kali Yuga, and four is to three, so two is to one ratio, where Kali Yuga is 432,000 years, that times two is the next one, that times three is the next one, that times four is the uh, final one. So all of these add to 4.32 million years. So Satya, Treta, Dwapara, Kali forms the Chatur Yuga of 4.32 million years and 71 of them forming a Mahayuga and 14 of them making a Manvantara and one of that making a Kalpa or a one day of Brahma. So in the in Srimad Bhagavatam, we are told that when there is uh, Brahma calls 
creation into being, and that is in one day of Brahma. Then over his night, which is also of a similar period of time, this pralaya or a dissolution, and there's also a period of silence, a sandhya, and a period of silence. And we also told that each Brahma lives for hundreds such Brahma years. We are in the 51st year of the current Brahma. In other words, the Indian model of cosmology is one of cyclical time, that it comes and goes in a certain time frame as we see over here, in contrast to our present-day uh, physics notions that say that there is a singularity that happened about uh, 14 billion years, 13.8 billion years ago, from where we are uh, today in, in this time frame. Whereas there are, uh, but it's interesting to see that the scale of time for Indians has ranged from very, very small periods to very great periods of time. You might wonder what other astronomical phenomena are known to the ancient Indians. And we have enormous evidence for a long tradition of astronomical observations. For example, lunar and solar eclipses. In Rig Veda Mandela 5, Rishi Atri, Atri is supposed to have observed a total solar eclipse. It's also there in Kaushitiki Brahmana. It's also there in that. And it is mentioned that Rahu swallows a sun, and this caused a lot of mirth for the Europeans who said Indians are a superstitious lot. They don't know what uh, eclipses. They think that demon called Rahu and Ketu, which don't even exist, and these do that. But what we see is Aryabhata has already described what this is in a very, very logical terms. In Aryabhatiya, Aryabhata has given formulas for the length of the moon's shadow, for the length of Earth's shadow during eclipses, and the duration of the eclipse itself, those kind of things are given. Additionally, if you remember, I told you that the ecliptic is a path taken by the sun. The moon's orbit around the earth is offset by five degrees from that ecliptic. Because of that, eclipses will happen at certain times when, they, when these two uh, uh, axes literally they merge over here at those ascending nodes or descending nodes that is when the eclipse can potentially happen. So Aryabhata referred to these nodes as Rahu and Ketu, clearly showing that this is the understanding of ancient Indians. Also with this, with this formula, able to predict when an eclipse will happen based on these things. Indians also observed a phenomena called precision. Precision is a phenomena wherein the axis of rotation of the earth is tracing a slow path in the sky, a huge path that takes 25,700 years to complete. So this path has happened, this uh, rotation is happening because of the gravitational action of the sun, the moon, and to a lesser extent, Jupiter and Saturn. And because of that, today we are pointing at Polaris. In uh, 3000 BC, when the Dhruva story was written, we're pointing at Thuban. And about 14,000 years from now, we'll be pointing at uh, Abhijit or Vega, which is another, another pole star over here. So the phenomenon was observed because the point at which an equinox would happen, either an equinox or solstice would happen, ancient Indians observed that that kept shifting in time. And so Vritigarga in about 800 BCE, he measured this to be 36 arc seconds a year. Hipparchus the Greek in 120 BC repeated the same figure as Vritigarga, 36 arc seconds a year. Suri Siddhanta has got a very accurate 54 arc seconds a year, for its time at least. Bhaskara II in 1150 current era, he measured this to 50.9 arc seconds a year. Patani Samantha Chandrasekhar Odisha, he measured this as 50.3 arc seconds a year using only naked eye observations and uh, crude instruments he made out of bamboo sticks. And a uh, modern figure is 50.4 arc seconds a year. So amazing to, to notice some of these things. Indians also observe transits. What is a transit? The inner planets, for, from our perspective, Mercury and Venus, sometimes they go across the face of the sun. And that is a transit called Grahayuti. And Indians were aware of this and they were able to also see this. This happened in 2016 when I took this picture and you can see that Mercury is this tiny black dot over here going across the face of the sun. So these transit and eclipse data was used to refine uh, estimates of uh, orbit rate, distance from Earth, many, many things can be done. And ancient Indians also were able to predict when this will happen and when it will leave. And their models could be refined if it did not happen at the uh, appointed time. 
in the Western Hemisphere until Galileo used a telescope in 1610. Kepler got a lot of data in 1630s. Only then, Europeans were in a position to predict a transit of Venus. That is the first in the Western world, whereas it was fairly routine in India to understand some of these things. And some recent instances of transit knowledge, Malikarjuna Suri in 1185 from Andhra Pradesh, he is referring to Venus and Mercury moving in orbits beneath the sun. And uh, uh, they do not appear dark like the moon because they're always near the sun and illuminated. Kamalakara was another astronomer from Maharashtra, and he's also talking about the same thing. He says they look like holes on the sun, and we know that they look like black dots going across the sun, which makes us wonder, how on earth did he observe it? Because if you see through the naked eye, you can't make out. You need a telescope that is sufficiently protected with a solar filter before you can see these things. But Kamalakara was able to see it and see, note that it looks like holes on the sun. Indians also observed planetary conjunctions. Conjunctions where are when uh, two uh, heavenly bodies come pretty close to each other. And this is referred to as a yud uh, in uh, Suri Siddhanta. So over here, uh, you see the conjunction of the five minor planets is considered their fight or association with each other. So this particular one, I took a picture a couple of years ago when Saturn came pretty close to Jupiter. So this is a conjunction. So clearly, Indians are also calculating when conjunctions will happen and uh, 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 predicting these kind of things. So the love story already talked to you about uh, Chandra loving Rohini. In this case, Chandra is occulting uh, Kritika in uh, 2006. And uh, 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 so Indians observed occultations and encoded in the story of Chandra and Rohini also. That is what we take out of that. Ancient Indians also observed comets. Comets are visitors with very large periodicity. If we can figure out the periodicity, that is, they're pretty uh, 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 large periodicity. So these are referred to as Dhumaketu in uh, Rig Veda, Ramayana, Mahabharata, Parasharatantra, Gritikarga, Paramira, as well as Sangamira, Tamil works. They all talk about comets. Unfortunately, the antiquity of these works are so great that we cannot identify what these comets are. But from 12th century onwards, we can reliably date uh, which comet uh, earlier uh, uh, people might have seen. But earlier ones, uh, we don't have a good way to measure some of these things. So what I've done for you so far is talk to you about a very, very early period of Indian astronomy without telling you how ancient those things are. I've talked to you about stories. I talked to you about the Nakshatra Rashi model. I talked to you about calendars of ancient Indians. So now we'll go to what are the sources and texts itself. And clearly we can't have a deep dive into these things. I'm only going to give a very brief overview of the span of astronomy works. So to begin with, we have to see that the applied mathematics process is there in Indian astronomical history. What does that mean? When we observe an astronomical process, we have some kind of a model. The model can be physical relationship using mathematics or can be some empirical model where I don't know what the relationship is, but I have, let's say, an epicycle model or some such thing, some kind of a model is there. And the evidence for these observations are there in Samhitas, Aranyakas, Upanishads, Vedanga Jyotisha, Siddhanta. And the evidence for modeling, modeling are causal relationships. You have perception and inference that is driving your understanding of a natural phenomena. We are seeing that the works of Rishi, Kannada, and Vaisheshika, we're seeing Aryabhata, Nilakanta Somayaji, so many have modeled things with mathematics and so on. And having got uh, a model and having made some observations and measurements of process, then you can refine these models, especially if they don't fit the observations you want to do. Then you make refinements, approximations, parameter estimations. And this is done in ancient India as well as in medieval India. And the evidence for this is all over the place, Lagada, Aryabhata, Bhaskaravan, Brahmagupta, Madhava, and in Western Europe for the first we see Newton and uh, allegedly Ptolemy, but then we don't know where Ptolemy got his data from. And we also see that once we have this model, we can use it for prediction, for tracking the heavenly bodies, where, they are, where they'll be after a period of time and so on. And if they don't go where they're supposed to go, that means your model is not good enough then you can refine it over time. We have evidence of uh, refinements of Indian 
astronomical models over time using something called PGEL and other things, where uh, if some, some, some estimate is off, you try to make new uh, measurements. So we see a logical, rational approach used by ancient Indian scientists where they identified a phenomena, they modeled its behavior, they measured the phenomena, they're using these measurements and refine the model so it fits the phenomena. They approximated the process to their best understanding and they made estimation of parameters. Then they use the model for tracking and predictions as well as these refinements. All these things are what a modern day engineer or scientist might do. And the earliest works like Rig Veda and Vedangas, we see numerals, arithmetic, addition, subtraction, division, counting of objects, how many cows do you have or how many gold coins you have, enumeration, such things. Then we see the mathematics of geometry, right angle, triangle, circle, pi, square root, for example, in Baudhayana Sulva Sutra, which is used for architecture. Then we are seeing the mathematics of arithmetic, algebra, solving equations, examples, Bakshali manuscript in 220 current era. That is used for commerce over the Silk Road, over the Indo-Roman trade, elsewhere. Clearly, there's evidence of commerce and mathematics of commerce used over there. Then for modeling, we see trigonometry, spherical geometry, approximation, solving equations, examples of Surya Siddhanta, Arya Bhatia that discuss modeling and mathematics of that. Then very advanced modeling. We see function approximation, properties, polynomial series, infinite series, solution of equations, algebraic geometry, calculus, combinatorics, and others and works of Pingala, Hemachandra, Madhava, Yukti Basha, Ramanujam, and so on. So, Clearly, we are seeing an application-driven growth of mathematics, and one of the biggest applications was astronomy. And we, we are going to see some of that presently. So we have a, a sampling of some of the sources and texts over here, and I've evocatively called this ancient, but I've not told you how ancient this is. So we have Vedas, Brahmanas, I've shown you, they contain calendrical information, the Puranas contain stories with astronomy, wisdom as metaphors, we saw the story of uh, Chandra and other such things. Then we have a whole lot of mathematical astronomy works. These are called Siddhantas, where there's mathematics involved over there, from Vyasa Siddhanta, Atri Siddhanta, Parashara Siddhanta, Kashipu, and so on. Many of these Siddhantas don't exist today. We don't have them. But we know they existed because of citation. Later works have cited some of these works, so we know that these works were there. But uh, today we don't have. So this gives you an idea of how much has been lost. How much has been lost because we don't have these things. What we do have is Vedanga Jyotisha, which I'll show later. We can date to 1400 BCE. And uh, Lagada is a person who uh, associated with writing this. We have Vritya Garga. The mistake should be 800 BCE. We have uh, Saura or the Suri Siddhanta. Some people claim that these are two. Uh, uh, Saura was an earlier version. Suri Siddhanta was a later revision and so on. And uh, uh, Varah Mihira has given commentaries of other Siddhantas like the Paitama Siddhanta, the Lomasa, which is also called Romaka Siddhanta, the Pulisa Siddhanta, Vashicha Siddhanta, but these Siddhantas also don't exist today. So we know they existed because of commentaries by Vara Mehira. And uh, this is a nice book that talks to you about uh, uh, some, of, some of these concepts. And Aryabhata uh, uh, wrote Aryabhatiyam, Arya Siddhanta. Unfortunately, we don't have Arya Siddhanta, we got Aryabhatiyam. Varamira, who wrote Pancha Siddhantika and Brihat Samhita and uh, Brihat Jataka also. Bhaskara I, uh, who lived in 600 current era, he wrote a Bhashya on Aryabhatiya. Now the issue is Aryabhatiya's works in Aryabhatiya is so terse because the, the Sanskrit use is so terse because remember, you're communicating a lot of information and palm leaves and to as tersely as you can. So if you don't understand how he did it or how he got it, there's no way you'll even probably understand it. So you need bashyas. Bashyas are like a PhD thesis, let us say, a commentary on that earlier work. So Bhaskara I wrote a bashya on Aryabhatiyam, which is a Mahabhaskariyam, Lagu Bhaskariyam. And Brahmagupta, very famous of Brahmasputta Siddhanta, because these works went from India to the Arab lands and from Arab lands into Western Europe and formed the basis of modern astronomy, mathematics, everything came from these uh, transmissions. Vateshwara, who wrote Vateshwara Siddhanta, Manjula, who wrote in uh, Lagu, uh, uh, Lagu on Manasan, and Aryabhata the second, the second Aryabhata, who wrote the Mahasiddhanta, Bhaskara the second, this one thousand current era to 1900 current era, who wrote the Siddhanta Shiroman. 
very very important work that uh, shows great refinements of mathematics and so on parameshwara who wrote again uh, critiques and other things works on aryabhata and others who belong to a kerala school of mathematics then we have nilakantha somaya ji who wrote uh, tantra sangraha in the aryabhatiya bhashya another bhashya on that work and a very famous mathemat uh, uh, astronomer mathematician ganesha devigna who lived 1520 who wrote these works just they were very important figure in modern times because he documented the works of his predecessors in the kerala school of mathematics in yukti bhasha yukti bhasha seems to have a uh, 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 calculus and elements of calculus and uh, by uh, understanding this we might understand the accomplishments of ancient indians in this uh, chandrashekar samanta who was in 1835 who lived in odisha he did not have access to a western education he was entirely brought up in the indian learning way of uh, uh, learning systems and he learned astronomy from his father's library of aryabhata's work baskara's works and other such works and he observed that many of the ancient uh, measurements done by these earlier astronomers were no longer accurate because of the phenomenon of precision so he made his own instruments out of bamboo sticks and other such things made naked eye observations and corrected all those texts so that they are up to date that's how he got this precision figure of 50.3 arc seconds his works siddhant darpana and we have several others also and uh, these are important siddhantas not going to be labor the point but uh, we have them from different regions of india it is not as if it is concentrated in northern india southern india you are seeing a tradition from patna rajasthan gujarat malwa central india gujarat ujjain B- bijapur in uh, kerala godavari andhra and other such places so clearly this is a uh, knowledge that is known mm. all over the country that is what it is shown so how did indian astronomy come to the attention of the west there were two transmission routes like i said one earlier transmission route through the arab muslims in 711 current era all the way to the 10th century when they uh, uh, took indian texts uh, destructively took indian texts translated them in, from sanskrit into uh, arabic and persian and injected that into spain where the monks over there translated arabic into latin and that is how western europe got to know about early indian astronomy works of aryabhata works of brahma uh, brahmagupta and others but the second line of understanding was the colonial period in the colonial period people like cassini in 1691 lee gentle who came to pondicherry 1768 euler bailey playfair samuel davis all of them discovered indian works and were utterly fascinated with the antiquity of the indian works and the complexity of these works remember europe was just on the threshold of learning systems at this point right the so called reformation and the renaissance was happening in just 100 years or so prior to this and so they were getting to know new things and looking at the antiquity of indian mathematics was amazing for them and everybody in the white font wrote very very praisingly of indian works but then william jones came along in this time frame and like i said he so sanskrit latin greek are related and the linguistic theory was born with him and the controversies also started among the controversy was if aryans came to india earlier they thought 500 bc later on 1500 bc then how old can indian astronomy be that was the uh, distortion that they came about how old is indian astronomy then where did it originate so they presumed it originated in babylon and in greece so they predispose a question to us what did indians learn from the greeks what did indians learn from babylon so these are the nature of uh, 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 scholarship even today in western academia so william jones bentley uh, early uh, writers who uh, started the controversies and wrote very disparagingly about indian astronomy in the middle was colebrook in the middle i'll put him because he was 50% this way 50% that way burgess who translated surya siddhanta but his views were overridden by his editor bitney bitney was a person who controlled burgess and bitney's opinion prevailed over the translation of burgess but burgess left an independent account saying how ancient the indian tradition is it owes nothing to the greeks whereas bitney and the others wanted to show indebted 
indebtedness of uh, Indian astronomy to the Greeks. So Whitney, Weber, Max Müller, Thibault, who translated Pancha Siddhantika and others uh, work in this uh, line. Jacobi was another person who went against the tide, showing that Indian works are enormously ancient. They have nothing to do with Greece and so on. And in modern times, you have Otto Neuchbauer, David Pingree, who continue this line of trying to show that uh, Indians have learned from Greeks and Babylonians. Calendar, a little more. We have a calendar. We talked about how the celestial calendar was based on observation of the sky, where the equinox happens, where the solstice happens, and so on. We also talked that Earth is doing precession that happens once in 25,000 years. That means the celestial calendar will also require revision. And to appreciate that, I have this GIF that is running over here. If you can see this first one, we have something called Milankovic cycles. Milankovic was a Serbian scientist in the 1920s. He identified these movements of the Earth as responsible for the ice ages, for the amount of radiant energy the Earth will get from the sun, and therefore uh, the ice ages and so on. So the first is this eccentric, this orbital cycle that takes about 100,000 years. Earth's orbit eccentricity changes from circular to elliptical in 100,000 years. This is very important to understand Indian astronomy. The axis of rotation is tracing this huge cycle in the sky that takes about 27,000 years to 26,000 years to complete. Then finally, you have a change in obliquity. This takes about 41,000 mm. years to complete, where it goes from 21 degrees up to 24 degrees. So many ancient observations are preserved in the ancient texts, very, very precisely saying what was the nakshatra at the point of equinox or at the point of solstice. These nakshatras will change because of precision, but they have been recorded by our ancestors who did this. Because of that, we can work back in time knowing the precision rate and say exactly when a measurement might have been done. So there are several things to understand of the geometry of the Earth's orbit, the cardinal points of astronomy, where does winter solstice happen, summer solstice, vernal uh, equinox, autumn equinox, reference plane, where is the horizon, ecliptic is the path that the sun takes, and where is the equator, uh, we need to understand the celestial equator, we need to understand that, and uh, reference points, the celestial poles, the axis of rotation, that is the north celestial pole, similarly south celestial pole, north, south, east, west directions, and overhead zenith. Ancient Indians knew all of these, and there are Sanskrit terms for each of these things too, showing how ancient some of these terms are. If you have to make a measurement of the skies, you need a coordinate system. Today, you can have something called the equatorial coordinate system, where the coordinate system rotates with Earth's rotation. Because they rotate with Earth's rotation, we can project Earth's latitudes and longitudes in the sky, and they become celestial coordinates. And we can use something called declination, which is latitude, celestial latitude, and right ascension, which is celestial longitude, to, to measure some star. So some star over here, we can talk what is its declination, what is its right ascension, and that way we can understand that. You can also have altitude azimuth coordinates, where this does not rotate now with the Earth. So if you have a star over here, with reference to the altitude azimuth, we can call it out. Ancient Indians used the ecliptic coordinate system. In the ecliptic coordinate system, it is an understanding of the sun's passage. How does the sun, what is the path of the sun? That is the ecliptic. With that, a position of a star could be measured with respect to these angles, literally. And the zero longitude was a vernal equinox position where the vernal equinox is, that is a zero longitude for that marked. If there's a longitude I draw over here, that marked the zero longitude for Indians. And we know vernal equinox changes with precision, the 26,000 year cycle I said. This necessitates a change in reference point in Indian astronomy. And we have evidence of that. We have evidence that the nakshatras referenced at the vernal equinox that are known from our literature Brigashirsha was in 4000 BC, Rohini in 3000 BC, Kritika 2300 BC, Barani in 1300 BC, Ashwini in 1800 BC, and so on. So we know that as it changes, the calendars have to keep track. Did Indians know about precision and trepidation? Where is the evidence for that? Evidence is in Surya Siddhanta. 
Surya Siddhanta has got this passage over here saying the circle of asceticisms liberates 600 times in a great yuga. Great yuga is a chatur yuga now. That is to say, they first moved westward by 27 degrees. Then they return to their former position. Then they go eastward the same number of degrees, then come back. In other words, it's describing a sine wave over here. If you start from 4900 BCE, zero degrees, it goes up to 27 degrees, 3100 BC, zero point in 1300 BC. Then the minimal point over here, minus 27 in the current era. Then this approximately time of Aryabhata over here, that going to 2300 current era in the future, that will be the zero point once again. And this happens over 7,200 years. So Professor Emil Raja, he's given a sample calculation over here. We see in a yuga of 4.32 million years, Suri Sudanta is saying it, uh, the circle of asterism liberates 600 times. That's how we get 7,200 years per revolution. So I'll tell you presently what Ayana Chalana is. Ayana Chalana is the Indian word for precision. So we have this 600 uh, uh, revolutions that we see, 27 degrees times four segments, one, two, three, four segments, converting degrees into minutes, multiply by 60, another 60 for seconds, and divided by 4.32 million years, we get 54 arc seconds in a year. That is how we know what Suri Siddhanta's understanding of precision is. And you might wonder, what did other cultures have? At the same period of time, what was other cultures understanding of precision? Suri Siddhanta, I'm not going to put a date on it because there's evidence of great antiquity in it, but we know it's 54 arc seconds a year. Parashara Siddhanta, 1400 BC, Professor Arana Ingar is calling this out, and he says that it also refers to 54 arc seconds. Pratigarga around 800 uh, BCE, Abhayankar, Professor Abhayankar shows that his understanding of 100 years per nakshatra can be understood as 36 uh, uh, arc seconds per year, one degree per 100 years. This exact same figure was repeated by Hipparchus in 120 BCE, 36 arc seconds a year. In China, you see in the year uh, 345 current era, estimated as 72 arc seconds a year, it's from Wikipedia. Uh, Aryabhata, in this time frame, measure it at 48 arc seconds. Now, this comes even closer than our Suri Siddhanta. It's more accurate. Al-Batani, uh, Arab, in this time frame, they copied Suri Siddhanta word for word. That's why you see the same figure, 54 arc seconds. Munjala, another uh, Indian scientist, he is called as 59.9 arc seconds. He's also proposed a circular precision. That is an important contribution. And uh, Bhaskara II, he critiqued Munjala's models and corrected the figure to 48.6, better than Aryabhata. And in modern times or pre-modern times, uh, Raja Jai Singh measured it at 51.6 arc seconds per year. And uh, like I said, Pathani Samantha Chandrasekhar in Odisha, he was able to get it to 49.179. I've also seen 50.3 arc seconds using classical methods. Understanding his methods gives us a window into how uh, ancient scientists like Aryabhata and others were able to estimate precision. The modern figure is 50.4 arc seconds. Now, I've also told you, I'll tell you about Ayana Chalna. Now, the sidereal coordinates, I said that the vernal equinox, it happens at a certain point at the Mesha Rashi. That is a zero point for our ecliptic coordinate system. And we call it the Nirayana system. So the Nirayana system uh, uh, is this one. The sidereal year is measured when the sun reappears in Mesha Rashi. In the Sayana system, this tropical, it is measured from one exact vernal equinox to the next. It is shorter than the sidereal year by 20 minutes, 24.5 seconds. This, because of precision, even if both were at the zero point, I showed you the zero points, if they're at the zero points exactly, they're going to start slipping by 50.4 arc seconds per year. In India, we call this Ayanamsa or Ayana Chalana. In 638 current era, Lalla, another astronomer, he measured this at six degrees. Ayanamsa has happened from the time of uh, Aryabhatta. So amazing to see uh, uh, some of these ancient measurements. Now, if we claim that Indians were able to measure all of these things, you might ask, where is the evidence for this? Where is the evidence for Indians to measure the skies? Well, we have got a whole lot of yantras or instruments that have been discussed in various works. We know in Harappa, there were water clocks. Water clocks are used to measure the time. 
Vedanga Jyotisha also talks about water clocks in 1400 BCE. We'll see why the time of 1400 BCE. Aryabhata is talking about several yantras here, shadow instruments, semicircle staff, circle umbrella, and so on. He also had constructed a globe, which he could control with a rope. He had constructed a globe and he could talk about reflection of the sun. He could understand enormous amounts of things. He also talked about rotation of the earth. He had the circular globe. Varaha Mira, in addition to these things, he also had people sundial and different kinds of gnomons and other things. Bhaskara Van talks about a circular platform with graduated circumference. This is very interesting to me because when I went to uh, Ahmedabad to see at uh, Lothar, uh, uh, Lothar, I saw these circular brick platforms, which nobody could explain why they were. And it turns out that it perhaps was used for astronomical observations, the same way that Bhaskara one is referencing over here, showing the antiquity of these things, going back to Lothal times, you're now talking uh, 1700 BC and so on. Lalla talks about Gola, armillary sphere, other, other needle and other such things. By the time we come to Mahendra Suri, it's already the Muslim times. He's talking about astrolabes. And Maharaja Jai Singh also used European instruments and uh, so on. So clearly, we have had 5,000 years of instruments, measuring, observing the skies, and all of these things, and estimating things. Now, if you can observe something, if you can model something, if you can measure something because of an instrument, the next logical step is, is there evidence of mathematical modeling for astronomy? So measurements should lead to modeling and prediction. And we want to see where is the textual evidence for this. A fascinating evidence is there in uh, uh, Vedanga Jyotisha. So Vedanga Jyotisha in this translation by Shastri, this is their Rig Vedanga Jyotisha and Yajur Vedanga Jyotisha in this verse 24 and 42. It talks about a rule of three. And in this translation, it says the rule of three is applied again and again. So the known result is multiplied by a quantity for which the result is wanted, divided by the quantity for which the known result is given. So this is what it says. And we see that in modern times, it's A by B equal to C by X. So X is B, C by A. In other words, uh, if, if you have a planet moving delta S units and a time delta T, then in capital T time, how many units does it move? You can use this rule of three and get this. Lagata is saying, apply it again and again. It is saying, iterate a prediction of motion. So very, very clearly, elements of calculus are there in 1400 BC itself. And we have evidence that linear is not enough. We have history of trigonometry. For example, uh, Western claims say Hipparchus is the father of trigonometry, but they had something called these chord tables. Chord tables is not trigonometry. Trigonometry is right angle triangles. And right angle triangles is there in Suri Siddhanta and Aryabhata and others talk about this. So clearly we're seeing uh, development of trigonometry because linear is not enough. You want a better nonlinear approximation and trigonometry allowed that better nonlinear approximation. And we're seeing functional approximation. Aryabhata used a linear interpolation. By the time you come to Bhaskara the first, he's got an uh, analytical expression for sin x and Brahmagupta, first order interpolation is not enough. He's using second order interpolation, showing that he wants better and better accuracy to estimate the curvature of the sky and so on. And by the time you come to Madhava, you have infinite series expansion. This shows evidence of observation, modeling, refinement. So quickly in the remaining time, I'll talk about the next great advancement, the planetary models of ancient India. So we have, for example, Western allegations that say that Aryabhata did not observe, for example, Pingri says that. And uh, we because because uh, Vedanga Jyotisha did not talk about planets, they even claimed that Indians did not know about planets till the British, sorry, the Greeks, the Greeks told them about planets and so on. So we have evidence of planetary modeling in Parashara Tantra, 1400 BC, Professor Arana Ingar's work. He dates Parashara uh, to about uh, uh, the time of Vedanga Jyotisha, which is 1400 BC. And it talks about path of Mercury, parts of seven, is giving some models, some numbers over here for that. Jupiter traveling two and a uh, quarter nakshatras in a year leads to good crops, is referring to a 12-year sidereal cycle for Jupiter. Saturn's travel through 27 stars is for 28 years. He has even estimated the model for that. And for Venus, there is also a, a verse over there that talks about Venus. And Venus cycle, according to Parashara, is 591 days, whereas the modern synodic period is 584 days. So clearly, 
elements of planetary modeling are known to Parashara itself. Then we see in Surya Siddhanta, the mean motion of planets. In a yuga, how many revolutions of the sun, he's calling out this number, of the moon, 57 million, of Mars, 2 million, of Mercury, 17 million, of Jupiter, 364,000, Venus, and of Saturn, and so on. Surya Siddhanta is now giving how many revolutions are there in a yuga itself. Yuga means Chatur Yuga, 4.32 million years. And this table from Surya Siddhanta is showing to you uh, about the number of revolutions in 4.32 million years. And through that, for example, for, for these data for the sun, we can derive the mean length of the solar year, 365 days and uh, uh, so on. We can estimate these kind of things. Similarly, period for Mercury is 87 days, Venus is 224 days, Mars is 686 days, Jupiter is this number, and so on. So the mean daily motion is computed from Suri Siddhanta's numbers by number of revolutions in a Mahayuga divided by the number of days in the Mahayuga multiplied by 360 degrees. We get how many degrees it proceeds in a day. Very, very interesting to see these constants over here. We have evidence of epicycle model. Remember, once you can have a model for a physical phenomena or an empirical uh, understanding of the phenomena, and we are seeing that uh, Aryabhata had a planetary model where Earth was at the center, Moon goes around the Earth, and uh, uh, Venus, Mercury, Sun, Mars, all of them go around the uh, Earth, but Venus has got its own cycle over here, two cycles over here. So we are seeing a two epicycle model, which he called Shigra and Manda, a fast epicycle and a slow epicycle, where there's something called an equant, where the center is offset slightly to account for obliquity of Earth's orbit, Plus, you have a pulsating model where the epicycle goes to contraction and expansion. So we are seeing evidence of spherical geometry, trigonometry, measurement devices, prediction, tracking, equation modeling, error correction, approximation, parameter fitting, all these amazing things. And by the time you come to Kerala in Nilakanta Somayaji 1400 uh, uh, current era, we are seeing a partial heliocentric model where Earth is at the center and Moon goes around the Earth. The Sun also goes around the Earth, but all the other planets go around Sun. Mercury, Venus, Mars, Saturn, Jupiter go around the Sun, and this ensemble goes around the Earth. So this exemplifies a dynamic tradition. Indians are not frozen in Shastra saying, that is what Aryabhata said, I'm not going to change it. No such thing. Indians have the intellectual freedom to go and uh, have a dynamic tradition over here. And this paper by Anil Narayanan talks about the pulsating epicycle uh, uh, that Indians had for the sun. And he's saying, showing how the Indian system is far more accurate than the Greeks. This is important to do these studies because the allegations that Indians learned about these things from Ptolemy and other such people and, and so on. So he's talking about this pulsating epicycle in contrast to the constant radius Greek epicycle uh, that was used. This is a remarkable feature. And he shows this interesting error graph where in 100 current era and 2000 current era, how much of error was there for the Greeks in the estimation of the solar longitude for the sun to come back to the same position, how much of error is there in these models So in, in one year's time. So we are seeing that in 100 current era, there was error in the Greek model. In 2000, the error is far greater. The Indian model, in 100 current era, the error is so much smaller. In 2000, our time is so much. In fact, you can work backwards in time and ask, when was the error the least? Very interestingly, the colonial historian Brennan, in his work on Hindu astronomy in 1800s, he did the study and said the epoch of Suri Siddhanta's epicycle parameters is best around 3500 BCE. Whereas Anil Larainan did the study and in his, he says at 5000 BCE, this innermost sinusoid, that's the least error, according to him. This is staggering. So it, it makes us question everything that we know and ask, how old is the Indian epicycle model? So uh, in the remaining time, uh, what, what we see is some selected astronomers and mathematicians over here. Ancient times, we talk about Lagada. Baudhayana, Katyayana, Pingala, several ancient uh, mathematicians are known. Some of these timelines might be a little surprising to you, but if you see my talks, you'll understand why some of them are placed over there. We're seeing 5,000 years plus of innovation and how mathematics, astronomy was arrested in the north after Islamic invasion and moved south under the protection of Vijayanagara Empire. 
and it died in the south too after colonialism. You see in classical period, Aryabhata, Varahamira, all these people thrived in the northern part of India prior to Islamic invasions. After uh, 1100s and so on, we see it thrived in the south where you have uh, uh, Kerala School of Math and others. But the last great is Kamalakara, 1657. Everybody knows about his work, Aryabhatiya, as well as enormous mathematics like Kutuka algorithm and uh, epicycle model, what eclipses are, rotation of the earth, many, many amazing works by him. Varahamira is very important for us because of his commentaries, Pancha Siddhantika, Paitamaha, Vashishta, Romaka, Apolisa, Surya Siddhanta. And uh, uh, by analyzing this, we can understand what is the state of knowledge in that ancient time. Brahmagupta, who lived in Ujjain in this time frame, how he studied the works of Aryabhata and others who preceded him. And then he wrote, uh, uh, wait a minute, uh, yes, Brahmagupta in Brahmasputta Siddhanta and others. And a lot of amazing mathematics that uh, he did. Arabs learned about mathematics from uh, Brahmagupta's works. Bhaskara I, we already talked about the sine function approximation. Bhaskara II, Siddhanta Shiromani, we see the elements of differential calculus, how he stated this truth over here at highest point, instantaneous speed is zero. This is very similar to what a high school uh, student might do to find out the maximum and minimum in uh, calculus of variations. Mm. It is expressed over here, as well as the estimate of precision of equinox. Madhava of Sangamagrama, all these approximations are known to his school and uh, an enormous amount of work on astronomy and mathematics and uh, uh, the understanding of his works continue on to the present uh, day also. And you had an expert lecturer yesterday, uh, Professor Subramaniam, who has worked, Ram Subramaniam has worked a lot in uh, Yukti Basha and other works. So the Madhava school uh, from Madhava, Parameshwara, Damodara, Nilakanta Somayaji, Jeshdeva, he's the one who wrote, uh, uh, summarizing the works by his earlier predecessors. So my final topic, the antiquity seen in Indian astronomy. We talked about Milankovitch cycle already and how this cycle can be used to estimate uh, 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 the antiquity of uh, ancient Indians. Vedanga Jyotisha. Many scholars tried to fix the antiquity of Vedanga Jyotisha. Weber, he said 500 BCE. William Jones, 1181 BCE. Lokmanya Tilak, very similar. Colebrook came close, but Dikshit was the one who came to the best approximation, 1400 BCE. And the reason for that is, as Abhyankar is showing, Vedanga Jyotisha is talking about winter solstice when the sun and moon come together in the Dhanishta nakshatra. So when was the sun and moon in Dhanishta nakshatra at the winter solstice position? So when the sun goes to winter solstice and the longitude is Dhanishta, as I've shown in this planetarium snapshot, uh, snapshot over here, you see that the time has to be cranked back to 1440 BCE. This is a time when winter solstice happened in Dhanishta Nakshatra. And because Vedanga Jyotisha is referring to winter solstice in Dhanishta Nakshatra, it has to be dated to 1400 BCE. Uh, Rishi Yagne Valkya wrote Shatapata Brahmana. In Shatapata Brahmana, he's got a statement saying, you can light your fires under the Kritikas, which is referring to Homa, the Vedic fires. And he's saying, Kritika does not move from the eastern side. Therefore, you can light your fires under that. And uh, this was, again, identified by Dikshit, Lokmanya, uh, Tilak, and others, who said that this is referring to the Kritika nakshatra, just Pleiades, happening in the, uh, on, the, on the celestial equator over here. If this is 90 degrees, this is 90, 80, 70, 60, 50, 40, 30, 20, 10, 0. 0 on Earth is the equator. In the sky, it's the celestial equator. On the day of the equinox, the sun is exactly on the celestial equator. And moreover, Kritika is the celestial equator in this time frame, 3000 BCE. So that shows to you the antiquity of Shatapatha Brahmana. Then there's an ancient epoch encoded in tables. Puranas talk about Kali Yuga, Aryabhata, Suri Siddhanta referred to this, Pulisa Siddhanta, Brahmagupta, temple epigraph in Aihole, and so on. And Cassini, he studied some astronomical tables that he got from Thailand. And those had the data from India, as well as the longitude of Ujjain and uh, Varanasi. And by studying that, he said the, the astronomical tables are declaring an epoch on midnight of February 17th, 18th, 3102 BC. Later, Playfair, Bentley, Colebrook, Burgess, they refer to the same thing in Suri Siddhanta and verified this. It turns out to be a conjunction of planets, sun and moon and Revati nakshatra. 
which today we are identifying as the start of Kali Yuga. And we can uh, see in Suri Siddhanta, it refers to this particular instant. Burgess has made this comment. But the interesting thing is over here, by looking at the planetarium software, cranking it back to 3102 BCE, we see that Revati Nakshatra is over here. We see that the sun is here, Chandra is the moon, and you see Guru and Shukran, which is Jupiter and uh, Venus is over here, Mangala, Mars, Buddha, and Mercury. Shani is a bit of Saturn, but otherwise they're all clustered over here, literally in, around this nakshatra. This turns out to be a conjunction in uh, 3102 BCE. We all know what Aditi, who along with the co-sister Diti uh, with Rishi Kashyapa, gave rise to the Adityas, the Rudras, Vasu, the path of the Devas, path of the Daityas, and so on. But what is interesting is, in the Aitriya Brahmana, this is the translation by Martin Hogg, it has got a cryptic line. It says, the sacrifice, Yajna, basically, went away from the gods, the Devas. The Devas were unable to perform any further ceremony. Remember, all the festivals are done by the celestial calendar. If the celestial calendar is confusing, you don't know when to do your festival. So they did not know where the Yajna had gone to. They said to Aditi, let us know the Yajna through thee. Aditi said, that is to let be so. But I will choose a bone from you. They said, choose. She chose this bone. All sacrifices shall begin with me and end with me. Very, very cryptic. What does it mean? It means that by the time of Aitriya Brahmana, wherever this time frame was, the calendar was already messed up because they could not figure out where is the vernal equinox position, where is something else, when do I do an auspicious act? So they have reset the calendar to Aditi. Aditi is referring to a particular nakshatra, in this case, Punar Vashu. So Aditi is saying the new year will begin and end with me. That is what she's saying over here. And we can see that uh, this was referred to by Tilak as well as Abhayankar. It's referring to vernal equinox at the Punar Vashu nakshatra. Punar Vashu nakshatra is these two stars, Diti and Aditi. This is Aditi, this is Diti. This is called Castor and Pollux in the Greek tradition. And this is the vernal equinox position. You can see this is 90, 80, 70, 60, 50, 40, 30, 20, uh, uh, 10, 0. So 0 is celestial equator, sun is over here. A staggering 6,000 BCE. Amazing date for this. All of us know the story of the Ashwinis and uh, how uh, 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 Sanjana could not bear the heat of Surya. She was Surya's wife. She could not bear the heat of Surya. So she... Uh, flees to the cooler regions by leaving her shadow Chaya in her place. Surya discovers the deception and he follows her. She's gone to the cooler region, meaning southern uh, hemisphere. Surya goes to southern hemisphere, meaning winter solstice over there. And the Ashwin, she's taking the form of a horse. He too takes the form of a horse. The Ashwini twins are born after that point. They mention many, many ricks that how they appear at dawn with uh, for heliacal rising. We have many verses that say, the Ashwinis appear at dawn for their share of the sacrifice. And that really refers to heliacal rising, winter solstice. Tilak pointed this out. That refers to winter solstice at Ashwini Nakshatra. And this turns out to be 7200 BCE. I will not labor the point, but there are many more such observations in Indian texts that have can be dated with precision to a great precision, literally, and to great antiquity too. Here is a conjunction mentioned with Suri Siddhanta how there is a great conjunction in Aries, and this turns out to be Mesha Rashi in February 22nd, 6779 BCE. Then the phenomenon of Swati. Swati is a nakshatra, Arcturus in the, in the Greek uh, name. And uh, this is one of the fastest stars in the sky. Even stars along the sun are going around the Milky Way galaxy, around the black hole over there. It takes 230 million years to finish one revolution. From our perspective, we can only see the angle changing, right? That is an angle called proper motion. Although they are three-dimensional velocity, with reference to a reference point, we can see how quickly is that angle changing. Swati is one of the fastest stars in proper motion. This is about two arc seconds a year. In the Greek records, Swati has been mentioned is off by one degree. With this rate, we can then say Greek records are 1,800 years old. Suri Siddhanta is also talking about Swati just six degrees off compared to our present day position. So six degrees into 60 minutes or 60 seconds divided by two arc seconds, it comes out to 8,000 BCE. Very, very, very ancient dates seem to be preserved in not the modern Suri Siddhanta, but maybe in a much older version, which has been carried forward and uh, uh, changed. With this, we can rebut 
Max Muller's chronology. That there is, even if he says that uh, there was a, a sutra period mm-hmm. during which uh, Jyotisha came about astronomy, then we can say Vedanga Jyotisha can be dated at a date of 3000 BC. So how is that possible? Rig Veda, he says 1200 BCE, but then the stories in Rig Veda, Aditi and Ashwini, it can be dated to much greater antiquity. So astronomy is showing something else. Max Miller was confronted with this. He was asked, should all of Indian chronology be held hostage to biblical chronology? Because that is where he came from. And he got so upset, he wrote this book in which he said that I'm not going to accept any Indian text as reliable. He says, I'll only accept Colebrook's Vedanga Jyotisha date because that is after Aryan invasion theory, 1400 BC. But the remaining things, he said, I'm not going to accept it. They're all unreliable texts. And till present day, even Indian scholars use the same line by Max Miller saying Indian texts are unreliable, but their understanding of astronomy is very, very poor. Today, we know that this failed methodology, this confirmation bias. Max Miller believed in 1500 BC Aryans. He believed in a biblical creation date of 4004 BCE. He could only accept uh, Colebrook's 1400 BC for Vedanga Jyotisha. He ignored all the evidence as unreliable. So that is what we say is uh, a failed methodology. But our scholars should know better, but they're not there yet. In modern times, Otto Neuchbauer, who wrote this book, Exact Sciences in Antiquity, and several papers, he claimed that the longest to shortest day ratio, three to two, is there in Babylon, as well as in Hindu astronomy. He says Varaha Mihira and uh, Tamil astronomers in 1825 were using a zigzag function to compute the moon's motion. It's the same as Babylon, it says on page 165. The terminology, zodiac names, all match the Babylonian records. And he says that Varamira incorrectly copied constants of planets from Babylon, not appreciating that Indians use ecliptic coordinate system. But the Westerners assumed Indians use polar coordinate system. That coordinate system confusion has what has given rise to these things. And he concluded Indians copied astronomy from Greeks and Babylonians. And uh, Professor Subhash Kak has rebutted this very ably in this lecture, the Babylonian and Indian astronomy. So please look for it and read it. Okay, okay. So uh, this has been continued by David Pingree and his student Kim Lofka continues that tradition and they continue to uh, uh, look at Indian uh, chronology. The concluding remarks, the deep history that we are taught in schools and universities in India is utterly wrong. We have evidence from multiple disciplines, whether it's astronomy, genetics, archaeology, that show the antiquity of the civilization. Five agencies are controlling historiography of India, even to present times, colonial, Eurocentric, missionary, socialist academy, and Marxist, and they don't change the narrative. Linguistic methodology has been used by them to prop their narratives, but it does not align with evidence from other fields, I showed to you what astronomy. Therefore, we can falsify these things. Indian astronomy initially encoded wisdom in stories using metaphors. They revealed concepts like sidereal month, synodic month, solar year, polar star, and many other things. Eventually, we see development of mathematics and uh, astronomy leading to many, many Siddhanta works. And the early models were Nakshatra and Rashi model to keep track of time and calendars. Then we see advanced models, epicycles and planetary models, mean motions to track the planet positions. And the antiquity that we see in astronomy is supported by material evidence from archaeology. I didn't have the time to share with you some of those things. And therefore, we have strong evidence to uphold the antiquity of the Indian civilization. So with that, I will conclude my talk over here. And uh, we can open it up for questions if there are any. My only request to you is, sir, please suggest some books to read. You see this one? This is one book I recommend. Uh, this is another book that I recommend, Subhashka, Astronomical Code of the Rig Veda, Indian Astronomy by Dr. Balachandra Rao. Then the History of Indian Astronomy by uh, Anil Narayanan. This is a very interesting account on uh, how the Westerners uh, discovered Indian astronomy. This is an excellent book by Vedri Arya, which is on Indian contributions to mathematics and astronomy. So you can uh, refer to this. Uh, this is uh, the book I talked to you about, uh, Exact Sciences and Antiquity uh, by Nuge Bauer. You can refer to this. There is also this book uh, by Abhayankar, which is... Uh, 
Pre-Siddhantic Indian Astronomy and Appraisal, very interesting book. You can refer to this excellent book by uh, uh, Professor R. N. Iyengar. This is uh, Parashara Tantra, very interesting. And if you are really mathematically inclined, then there is this excellent book by uh, several authors, Professor Ramasubramaniam, M.D. Srinivas, and M.S. Uh, Sriram, Ganita Yukti Basha, on the mathematical astronomy of Jeshtadeva. There's a two-volume set. So the second volume deals with uh, astronomy itself. So there are several books that you can refer for a range of interests. And I suggest uh, some of the simpler ones would be uh, Abhyankar, Pre-Siddhantic uh, Astronomy. A lot of uh, facts from uh, Vedviraria, Indian contributions. This is good. And obviously, Professor Subhashka, it's always a delight to read his books. So uh, Astronomical Code of the Rig Veda. And I, I suggest also this book by Balachandar Rao for beginners. Uh, there's a lot of com computations that is given that will help you to understand how ancient Indians did computations. Professor Balachandar Rao was a mathematician, a professor in mathematics. And uh, so uh, it's very sound, all the calculations and other such things. A lot of insights are given. You will not find these kind of elementary calculations in any other book. So I recommend this book in addition. It's from Bharati Vidya Bhavan. Hello. Okay, once again, it's not very clear, but I guess your question is, uh, why are the Europeans not acknowledging the ancient Indian dates? Is that the gist of your question? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, okay. So the you must look at the historiography of India. Like I said, it started with colonial historiography. When the colonial people came to India in the 1700s, they strongly believed in a creation date of 4004 BC. They belonged to the Anglican Church. And at that time, they believed God created the world in 4004 BC. God destroyed the world in Noah's flood in 2500 BC. And the rest of humanity is from Noah's children, which is Japheth, Shem, Ham, and uh, so on. So this is the racial theory according to them. When they encountered Indian works of great antiquity, they couldn't take it. They said that uh, where does Indian history begin? Where does it end? There's no way they understood because there's no chronology between Eastern and Indian. And Western. So they came across Majesthini's work, Indica, where he's mentioned somebody called Sandrakutus. So they went through the Purana chronology and they said, okay, there's somebody called Chandragupta Maurya, and that must be Sandrakutus, and that is the anchor point for Indian and Western uh, uh, history timelines. Unfortunately, in the Purana tradition, uh, we have to put um, uh, Chandragupta Maurya to approximately 1200 BC, if I'm not mistaken but they pulled him down to 300 BC. So this kind of cherry picking was done by William Jones and others by saying some of the Purana King lists are mythical, these are real, that is mythical, and they reduced the chronology in order to fit the models which they had. And what were those models? Initially, it came with the biblical model of 4004 BC, Noah's flood. Later on, it became because of Aryan invasion. Aryan invasion by linguistic analysis had to happen in 1500 BCE. So you could not have had a Vedic Sanskrit tradition in India prior to 1500 BC. So if you saw anything before 1500 BC, that must be spurious. And they have to correct it. White man's burden, right? They correct our chronology. That's what happened. So the amazing thing you see today is the hypocrisy. The Babylonian or Mesopotamian king list, that goes back to an enormous time frame from 2000 BC, 500 BC, 2018 BC. That is accepted without question. Egypt king list, uh, pharaohs and so on, goes back to old kingdom of uh, Egypt going to, it, again, 3000 BC, accepted without question. It is only the Indian king list in uh, uh, Puranas that is not accepted. Some of them are uh, discarded as uh, mythology, and some of them are uh, said uh, cherry pick and put some, uh, some here, some elsewhere, and so on. So the reason is primarily to fit this linguistic analysis in order to explain why are Sanskrit, Latin, and Greek related. Their answer to put some distance between Indians and Europeans is to say that the ancestor of all these languages is Proto-Indo-European, and this language is in Central Asia between Caspian Sea and Black Sea. 
So those speakers are the ones who went to Europe and became the future Europeans. And they also came to India and uh, they became the Aryans and the Vedic people and so on. And uh, the reason why all these languages are, have got similarities is because uh, uh, they, they have a common ancestral language, PI. So this is the theory which is pushed even today in the, in the textbooks and research and academia and so on. This is what we see. So unfortunately, uh, even though the evidence is overwhelming in this, if, for example, today we have got carbon dating from Mehegar, from uh, Rakigari, from Birana, going back to 7,000 BC, 7,500 BC, that is 9,000 years before present, we have evidence of uh, uh, habitation in these places. If you look at the paleontological finds, we got skulls from Narmada Valley and places like that going back about 350,000 years ago. If you go to uh, 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 the, the, you know, rock paintings, if you go in places like Bimbetka and others, 30,000 years ago, you got all kinds of things. There is an amazing array of uh, archaeological and paleontological artifacts showing India has been occupied continuously for a very, very long time. So the evidence from archaeology, evidence from genetics, evidence from astronomy, evidence from climatology, evidence from uh, hydrology, whether it's Saraswati River and other things, all of them point to the fact that India is an ancient civilization. There is no periodization as Harappa, no periodization as uh, Vedic. Such a periodization is spurious. Rather, we are seeing that the astronomical works are going back to overlapping Harappa and great antiquity. And the observations of Saraswati and Rig Veda, they happen to go far beyond the time when uh, Vedic Aryans are supposed to have come to India. Saraswati River dried up in 1900 BC. But then Rig Veda Mandalas are talking about flowing Saraswati River. How is that possible if uh, Max Miller is right? He says that 1200 BC is when Rig Veda was uh, composed. But then how can they talk about a flowing river when no such river existed? So, so we got paradoxes. We got paradoxes all over. So we're using perception, inference, and a very, very logical, rational way of analyzing evidence. We come to the conclusion that the linguistics model is incorrect. It has got several problems. We have to consider the archaeological model, the genetics model, the astronomy model, and hydrology model, several other models, and all of them point to the inescapable conclusion that Indians are an ancient civilization. This is utterly opposed to what the Western uh, civilization would like to look at India as. They want to look at India as a recent civilization from 300 BC. Indians are illiterate and uncivilized till Magadha made contact with Alexandrian Greeks in 300 BC. That is when we got writing. That is when we borrowed all these texts. We became literate and other such things. This is the notion out there. And so the works like what I'm doing and many others are aimed at showing the hypocrisy in these things and uh, uh, where the scientific evidence is.